Let's start with a prayer in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Can you hear me okay with this mic? Good? I crack myself up. <laughs> um, okay, so we have, um, through Sam's presentation, look at kind of diocesan-wide, what, what some of the initiatives are going to look like over the next year, kind of plan to ignite and bolster um, all vocations within the Diocese of Grand Island. Um, so here, this talk is going to be like, for you, like, and you. And you all, or in Oklahoma, y'all, all right? <laughs> this is for like you guys. So what can you do as the third grade CCD teacher, as the youth minister, as the parish volunteer, as just a, ca a Catholic at your parish? What can you do to help with this? Okay, so right off the bat, have you guys read Bishop Hannafelt's letter that he wrote? A few months ago. Wow. Close your ears for a second, Bishop Hannibal. It was, it was beautiful, right? Beautiful and stark and give a kind of realistic picture of where things are. And what you need in the Diocese of Grand Island, which is pretty typical, by the way, you need saintly priests in this diocese. A lot of them. You need saintly religious sisters in this diocese. You just do. You need saintly married couples and single people in all vocations. You need, you need a lot of them. The people around who are unbelievers, who are not Catholic, they 100% need to see those lights on a hill. They need to see Jesus in you guys. Okay, so you need numbers. Sam and I, like, we joke around. It's not about the numbers, but it's kind of about the numbers, right? <laughs> like, you need, because you have parishes that need pastors, and those pastors, like, give the Eucharist out, right? They hear confessions, they baptize, and the church, like, needs those things. So you 100% need more priests, more good priests, more religious sisters, more good religious sisters. You need those things. What are you looking for in your parishes? When you think back to your campus ministry, to your school, at your parish, who's our target audience? That's what we're going to, like, this first question who is your target audience? That is, people who are like really good. Again, we're going to focus a little bit more on potential discerners for the priesthood and religious life. That's where this particular focus is, right? So in your parishes, who are you looking for? Is it only those with glowing hands? My hands glowed a lot. That's how they knew. No, you're not. Are you only looking for those who have this like halo right here? No. Are you only looking for those in your parish who you just like have a hunch about? Ah, I think they'd be a good priest. No, nope. it's actually a little bit more objective than that. Because what if you just don't happen to like that person? That's a personality difference, not a it has nothing to do with vocation. It's just like that, actually, that person annoys me. And I don't think they'd be a good priest because they annoy me, right? That's not your objective, right? A hunch is not your standard. We're going to give a standard to you that is objective, that you can go by. And when you see these things, you strike, all right? And we're going to talk about what that looks like a little later. When you see these things, this is an objective standard, that when you see it in your parish, you get in there. They 100% need your help. They 100% need your help. So when you see in your local Catholic community, whether it's what, school or whatever, parish, campus ministry, 90% of them, 90% of them are going to be ages 16 to 25 years old. 90% are going to be 16 to 25 years old. 
They're going to be unmarried. <laughs> if they're already married, don't be talking to them about being a priest, right? Not, <laughs> not particularly helpful. They may go, no, oh, never mind, we're not going to go there, okay? Anyway. <laughs> unmarried, 16 to 25, and there's a standard of four characteristics. If you see one or more of the following four characteristics, your Catholic ears should perk up, and you should consider getting in there. All right? Here they are. You ready? They speak fluent Latin. <laughs> what? What's so funny? At Mass, they levitate. Clear sign, right? Clear sign. Just kidding. Here they are, the four. Are you ready? Got your pens and papers out? Here you go. Number one, 16 to 25, unmarried, Catholic, at Sunday Mass. I'm dead serious on that one. Are they at Sunday Mass? If so, you should take a mental note. Okay? Why is that important? Because if they're still 16 to 25 and their mom has not drugged them by the ear to Mass, they're there on their own volition. Most of their friends have left at this point, And they're there pursuing the Eucharist. Okay? Are they at Sunday Mass, number one? Number two, do they go to confession? <laughs> you see them in the confession line? What does that tell you? It sounds so simple and so Catholic. But most Catholics actually don't go to confession, right? Most people their age went when they were in second grade, maybe once again in third grade, and have not been back. And here they are, not yet a saint, but really trying to grow in their faith life. It's a big deal. Are they going to confession? If you see them in the line, just take a mental note. Don't ask them what they're confessing, right? It's kind of rude. Number three, do you see them praying in the church? They're going to be doing this. You're going to, they're going to go to Mass early, and they're going to be praying before Mass. After Mass is over, you're going to see them probably praying after Mass. If there's adoration times, they're probably going to be like seeking adoration out on their own. What does that tell you? It tells you they love the Eucharist, and they feel a certain comfort with it, and want to be close to the Lord, right? Very, very priestly. Do you see them in adoration? If so, psh, psh, mental note. Characteristic number four, they're probably volunteering around the parish in some way. They're probably helping out with the youth group. Or they are your youth minister, <laughs> right? They're probably like the lead altar server that we talked about earlier. They probably are leading some ministry or involved with some ministry. They're probably volunteering in some capacity. They're like quick to, to help out and serve others. When you see one of those four characteristics in someone who's 16 to 25, unmarried in your parishes, and they are either, not all four, by the way, you need one. You just need one of the four. And you see them at Sunday Mass, or going to confession, or praying in the church, or serving your parish in some way, you should take a big, fat, mental note. Because they are doing what 95% of peers their age no longer do. As we talked about earlier with the mustard seed, Discovering a vocation is just like that. It starts very small and imperceptible, and then just grows. It grows and matures and flowers. And at this stage, they don't look like a priest. They don't talk like a priest. They're putting pamphlets in their pocket secretly at this stage, right? But like over here, they're like thinking about it a little bit more. And they're talking about it a little bit more. Here, they're thinking about it a lot on a daily basis. Here, it's something that they like long for and desire. 
Most of where you are going to encounter in your parishes, they're not here, right? That's years down the road. They're like in here somewhere. So you're going to see people, the potential vocations, they're going to be just, I mean, just starting out. Just starting out. And so if they're not speaking fluent Latin, it actually doesn't matter. Right? That doesn't matter. If they're not levitating, they're just human beings. Okay? But what they are doing is they are trying to grow in their faith life. They are interested in God. They're interested in helping other people do the same. And so you on the front lines, oh my gosh, they just need your help so bad. They need your support so bad. We'll come back to that in a little bit. Does that make sense what you're looking for? Okay, those four characteristics, it's an objective standard. Don't go by your hunch. Okay, we, I think we miss a lot of people because, well, that person seems really, she seems really, really conservative, and I'm not really conservative, so I don't really want her to become a religious sister. Like the standard is like whether you like them or not? No, that is not the standard. The standard for young men and women in your parish is that you see them at mass, confession, prayer, and service. If they're doing one or more of those things, that's your person. To get practical for a second, you like confirmation teachers, right? Who are we looking for? There's going to be, if there's 10 students in your confirmation class, seven of them are going to be totally disinterested in what's going on. Three are going to be pretty engaged. Two of those are going to be asking questions every week and like probably answering those questions. That's your person, right? That's the one you're going for. When you walk into the church on Saturday afternoon and there's 10 people at the confession line and nine of them are 70 years old and older and one is 21 years old, that's your person, right? That's your guy. That's the one you're looking for. Something is growing inside of them. Okay? Those people are going to stand out. And your youth groups, our CIA people, in the Diocese of Tulsa, a third of our seminarians, a third are converts. A third are converts. And I bet more, than, like within the last five years. And so if you're like an RCIA, and there's, you know, the vast majority of the people are 50 and up, and there happens to be one 17-year-old in there who's coming not with his family, but because he just really he has read himself right into the Catholic Church. That 17-year-old is your guy, right? That's the one. He can't become a seminary right away. He's got to wait at least two years. But hang with him, and I bet you, I, I bet he, he, it's on his mind. So they're going to stand out like sore thumbs, right? They're just, they just are. The young, 16 to 25, you're going to see them around your parish, and when you do, you better be praying for them. Okay, when I was 16 years old, Father Bob Schlitt, whoa, in the Diocese of Tulsa, he's like revered. He's just a legend. Anyway, he's responsible for about a, a quarter of the priests in our diocese came from Father Bob Schlitt. He just was so good about asking guys if they thought about this. Anyway, when I was about 16 or so, um, he asked me, he said, would you like to go to dinner some, sometime? And I was not particularly like fanatical about the church. I was, it was in youth group and he just singled me out and I was like, sure, yeah, absolutely. Sounds good, because everybody loved Father Bob. I didn't know what he wanted to talk about. Anyway, while we're at dinner, I'm, we're just kind of small talk, small talk, and then he just goes, what do you want to do with your life? And I was like, ooh, uh, I had like meatball stain on my cheek, you know? I like, wasn't, <laughs> wasn't really expecting a deep question like that. And I was like, well, I think I want to play professional baseball. I want to marry someone, have about 12 kids, and be rich and famous. And he just, like, I, like the, my shallow answer met his sincerity, and it just died. Like, it didn't go anywhere. And I looked at him, and he was just like, what, like, what do, you, what do you really want to do with your life? And at that point, I couldn't, like, joke. I was like, actually, I, I really don't know. And he said, have you ever thought about being a priest? And I said... I think about it every day of my life, Father. 
Is that what I said? I said, oh yeah, that's the celib that celibate vocation? I, des I long for that. Is that what I said? You know what I said when Father Bob asked me that question for the very first time? You know what I said? I said, heck no. Not only no, but heck no. All right? It just was not even an option. Okay? Which is why I've done a lot of vocation work in my day. Which is why the beginning stages... The stage before curiosity, there's actually like a negative one maybe we can add in there. The beginning stage of discernment, I, the technical term for it, is the heck no stage. Ask any of these priests, when you were asked about it for the very first time, what was your response? No way, Jose. You religious sisters, I bet you the first conversation that it came up, I bet you it was Got a respect for the priests. God calls some people to that, but he doesn't call me. The answer is no. That's the first, really that's like the pre-negative one stage, right? Is the heck no stage in the discernment process. However, I got to know Father Bob really well, and we continued having conversations. And when you're 16 years old, you got a million questions about the faith. And he, just like a good shortstop, fielded it, and I mean, zipped it right back. It was so good with my questions. Then I like, trusted him, and I started going to confession to him a lot. And he helped me like, grow. He taught me about like, the Bible, opened that up for me. That was a pretty archaic, weird book, right? <laughs> Have a few conversations with Father Bob. It started to actually make a lot of sense. So when I was 18 years old in high school, I was in a business class, still at our high school, and we had like a... Like a um, like a career day, you could like job shadow somebody for a whole day, you know, so you could like job shadow a teacher, or you could go to the hospital, or write a police officer, and at this point, I was like becoming pretty Catholic, like my parents were getting worried, actually, they were like, okay, here we go, anyway, um, they, and I thought, you know what, I've been like thinking more and more about being a priest, why don't I father, or why don't I follow Father Joe at this point, Father Bob had passed away. And so I called Father Joe and just asked him, can I, like, job shadow you for a day? And he's like, sure, come on over. So I went to St. John's Church in Stillwater, Oklahoma, and I arrived, and we talked for probably 20 minutes, and then the phone rang. It was the hospital. And they said, Father, someone's dying. Can you come quick? And I was like, here we go. <laughs> like, Talk about like getting a ride in a cop car during like a high speed chase or something. This was like, this was like some action, right? So we get in the car, we go to the hospital, we go over there, and I don't actually remember why, but I was like, I like walked in first into the hospital room, which was, anyway, I don't know why that happened, but I did. I was excited or something, I don't know. So I walk into the room, and like, there's this lady, 80 some years old, on her deathbed. Surrounded by the family, it's dark, and they're there, and like in walks this high school kid. So they're like, "What the heck are you doing here?" Like, I was like, "I don't know. I'm out of here." Like, <laughs> anyway, so I like, and Father Joe is at the door at that point. He kind of stops me and kind of just says, "Just, just, you just stand over there for a second, okay? Just get out of the way." And Father Joe Townsend walks over to this this 80 year old lady dying. And he goes right up. I mean, she's laying on her bed. He's like kind of face to face. He puts his hands on her hands, and he just starts to talk to her. And we're all watching. And then he prays with her. And then he anoints her. He says her last rites and tells her what's going on and what's about to happen. Like she's, she's, about, to, she's about to pass away. He gives her her very last Holy Communion. There's a first Holy Communion. There's also a last. It's called Viaticum. Very beautiful. Gives her, her, gives her Viaticum. Then when he stands up, he talks with the family, kind of jokes a little bit. We all pray together. And then Father Joe and I leave. I was stunned. I, hadn't, I, just, I had not had a lot of experience with death at that point. And so I go, 
within two seconds of the situation, I like had a panic attack. But Father Joe Townsend, he brought Christ. And I watched it with my own two eyes. He brought comfort. He brought peace. He brought laughter. He brought sincerity. He brought truth. He brought Jesus in the sacraments. And I watched it happen. And after that, I was like, if that's what priests do, like, Lord, if you want me to do this, I'll, like, yeah. Yeah. That's a pretty amazing thing to do. And this was like Tuesday afternoon, right? This was not like a, a big priestly, I don't know, we didn't plan for six months for this. He got a call 20 minutes before. And I watched it with my own two eyes. From that moment, heck no phase was gone. But I was pretty curious about it. When I saw that, I was really interested. I was really interested in becoming a priest. If I saw those like life human moments, Christ being brought to that, boom. Lord, if you want me to do that, okay, I'm pretty open to that. You got it. I joined the seminary at age 20, went to two years at Oklahoma State, and was in that environment, and boom, it was for me. I, I knew it wasn't until here that I was like, for sure, yeah, I want to be a priest. And so do you see that progression? There's actually very organic progression. This is sort of the logistics, kind of on the outside what's going on. But on the inside, it happens like this. Heck no. I will not become a religious sister. Or I will not become a priest. Right? Then it becomes a curiosity. All right, I'm open to this. Then they're interested. And after a while, they desire it. They desire it. I am so thankful that Father Bob and about 25 other old ladies of the parish kept bringing up the priesthood to me. (laughs) I am so thankful because I 100% love being a priest and cannot even imagine what my life would be like without this. Like, it's hard to even, I don't know, it's like, imagine the day without the sun or something, you know? It's like, it doesn't really compute. I am so glad people had the courage to walk up and put it on my radar, even if my initial answer for a while was not only no, but heck no. You got a problem here in Grand Island. You have a big problem, actually. Father New Hoke is awesome, but he drives really slow. (laughs) It's true. He's a slow driver. And you have a huge diocese. It's pretty expansive, right? Who's like the furthest away at this point? Is there anybody that's three hours away? You are? Four hours away? Anybody be four hours? This is like the wedding. Anybody been married longer than one year? You stay. <laughs> Anybody beat four hours? That's pretty far. You can be how far? Four and a half. Anybody beat four? Four and a half. Anybody? Give anybody do we have five? Do we have five? <laughs> you got five over here? Four five? Four and three quarters. <laughs> you hit some stoplights. We got five over here. Anybody beat five? We have five and a quarter. Anybody go for, did anybody like get in traffic? It took five hours, 15 minutes to get here. All right, five hours. That's a long, right? You have a pretty expansive diocese, and he drives really slow. And he has 13 other jobs. Okay, you got a problem. He 100% is really good, by the way. Really good at what he does. I've known him a long time. But he's one man, and you've got a huge diocese. He absolutely needs your help. He absolutely needs your help. And so, okay, at this time, ladies and gentlemen, please raise your right hand. (laughs) Talk about deputizing? Ladies and gentlemen, please raise your right hand. If your neighbor has not, does not have their hand raised, give them one of these. 
Please repeat after me. <laughs> Very funny. I state your name. Don't say state your name. For heaven's sake. I state your name. Will faithfully discharge the office of assistant vocation director with uh, liberty and justice for all. <laughs> He's now your boss, people, all right? Okay, now you're in the club. Now you got, you're put to work. You're confirmed Catholic Soldiers for Christ. Now you are assisted vocation directors in the Diocese of Grand Island. Here's what you do. When you see somebody who's like in your parish, and they are like the confirmation student that's really engaged, or they're like the lead altar server, or you see them in the confession line, or you see them in adoration, or they're at mass, or they're serving in some capacity, here's what you do. Here's your job description, okay? You walk over to that person. Say it's a guy. And you say, excuse me. Have you ever considered being a priest? And then you zip it. You, you shut up, Okay? Most of the time, people want to like apologize for that. And they want to say, like, okay, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry to take up your time, your precious time, 17-year-old, right? Like, I'm so sorry to bother you. I know you're really busy. All right? But I was just thinking, you know, perhaps like, have you ever once considered the idea of being a priest? And if you haven't, it's totally okay. You know, it's like you're like, you're like I'm sorry to even bother you, but I, know, I just want to leave you at that. Okay, have a nice day. Don't do that. This is serious. This is like their life, okay? So you ask, have you ever considered being a religious sister? And you zip it, and you let that sink in, because chances are they haven't. And if it's the first few times they've heard that phrase, what's the response likely to be? <laughs> Heck no. And you say, you're expecting it at this point, and you say, great, well, I, I think you should at least think about it. I see you around the church quite a bit. I think you should at least think about it. I'll pray for you. And you walk away. Boom, that's it. That's it. Two weeks later, someone else is going to walk up to that young man and say, have you ever thought about being a priest? And he's going to say, no, and leave me alone about it, right? Like, no, the answer is no. But then he's going to go home. When that happens two or three times, he's going to go home and say, what am I missing? Like pe people, people are seeing something in me that maybe I'm not seeing. These are people that have known me for a long time. Maybe they don't. Maybe they just, they just see me around the church. Maybe I, should, maybe I should think about this for a second. And boom. Boom. They just exited the heck no stage and just entered the curiosity phase. Now they're wondering, what would it be like to be a priest? I wonder if God actually might be calling me. Yikes, that's kind of scary. And boom, you just helped them make this quantum leap that sets them apart from 95% of the other Catholics in their age group. They are now curious slightly open to becoming a priest or a religious sister. You, with that right there, with those simple words, could set off a train. I mean, an awesome ripple effect. Thank you. Like, Father Bob does not ask me the, that question. Those old ladies don't ask me that question. I'm not standing before you today. I've not been a priest for 11 years. All those confessions, all those weddings, all those baptisms, all those people I like, brought into the church, all the seminarians we're helping prepare for the priesthood right now. Right? You have no idea. And not to mention, though, the, the people that I've impacted, who they will impact, 
two, three, four, five, 10, 15 generations from now. It's unbelievable to think what God can do with your courage. When you see somebody who might fit this bill and you walk up and just say, have you ever considered being a priest? You plant that seed and man, let's just watch that thing grow. Grow, 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 boom. Now we have a priest. God willing, this is the job, this is the great job of the vocations office. One of their main jobs, one of their main jobs, there's several, but one of the main ones is, they're like the pipeline. Their job is to crank out happy, holy, healthy priests into your diocese. That ideally, never again there's going to be, is there going to be a six-year gap between ordinations. Meanwhile, nine priests have retired, right? God willing, that will never happen again in this diocese. Because he's got help galore. You are planting seeds. You are praying for them. You are supporting them. You are encouraging them in your schools, in your RCIAs, in your youth groups, in your parishes. If you're just a parishioner, just, yeah, with help galore, that's going to help them understand and see this is a life worth living. Hopefully, in 10 years, 20 years, you have another vocations problem. You have too many. Now you're like wondering, how are we going to afford all these seminarians? What are we going to do with all these priests? Maybe we'll send them out to other dioceses who aren't as blessed. as That's what we want for Grand Island. We want awesome priests. Every one of those, every one of those that gets ordained, God willing, will spend 50 years in your diocese giving out Holy Communion nearly every day. Think about that. So for 50 years, people will come to them broken, guilty, ashamed, and through that priest, they're going to experience the forgiveness of God for 50 years. That's phenomenal. Unbelievers will come to know Jesus through him. Marriages will be assisted because of him. God works in lots of different people, right? But the priest is one of the, one of the biggies. He's one of the biggies. He brings the sacraments. People on their deathbed for 50 years, God willing. He's going to be visiting people in their dying moments. And maybe, where's Trevor? Is Trevor still here? Trevor, ordination class, 20, 20, 29, right? Something like that. Something like that. His family's had a big impact on him becoming a seminarian. Let's say, God willing, he becomes a priest in the year 2029. Maybe, just maybe, 30 years from now, a young high school kid will have gotten sick of old ladies and priests saying, have you thought about being a priest? You're like, hey, hang around the church a lot. And he finally goes, fine, I'll see what this is about. And they go, he goes and finds his local pastor, Father Trevor. He says, can I follow you around for a day? And in a few hours, he sees what a priest does face to face and goes, oh my gosh. Okay, Lord, you want that? If you want me to do that? Okay, I'll do that. And then we just set off this train reaction right here that in 30 or 40 years later, a young man might come to that. I mean, it's just awesome to think about, right? What God is able to do with you helping out these young people. The, word, the world is getting weirder and weirder and weirder. All right? They, these seminarians, these discerners, these young people in your parish, it's not self-evident to them. They 100% need your support. They need your help. They need your prayers. They need your fast. They need you to offer mass for them. They need you to encourage them. They need you to write letters to them. And acknowledge, they need you to say, I am so proud of what you're doing. I really respect it. If you need anything, let me know. They need that. God willing, if they become priests, they'll become holy priests that set the world on fire for Jesus Christ. And you will have had a big part to play in that. God bless you.